All right. Well, I want to welcome everybody to today's Spatial IQ for MapGeo webinar, um, The Power of a Great Visualization. Um, this webinar is part of our educational series that we do every single quarter. Um, we've been doing this these webinars for the past five years, roughly, um, and we do four webinars uh, throughout the year. And it just shows different topics um, that we find interesting that we would like to share with all of you um, on some powerful GIS um, work that we've been doing and that's possible out there. So let's get started. First, we're gonna talk about some logistics. Everybody is currently in listen only mode. Um, you have the ability for a Q&A and a chat box. Um, we'll be utilizing those today during our webinar. We have a couple of polls, um, and then we will have questions at the end where you can put those in those boxes. Um, as always, this webinar is being recorded, so this will be shared out uh, afterwards, and it will also be posted on our library of webinars as well. Um, and a little bit about our Spatial IQ for Map Geo program. Um, it is a managed services program designed to help subscribers make the most out of their Map Geo, sub Map Geo subscription. And we encourage our subscribers to push the limits of Map Geo, whether that's adding new and interesting new themes to Map Geo with some new overlays um, or expanding and using the um, subscription of Spatial IQ for the tier benefit packages for your uh, hosted downloadable data that's on MapGeo, any GIS help desk support, along with those strategic plans, but also with the inclusion of the uh, geospatial data updates, which includes your parcel updates and zoning updates and all of those foundational data layers that are used every single day by everyone in town. Um, and obviously these webinars are also included as part of that subscription. So let's take a look at our agenda. We have short speaker introductions, and we will also talk about the importance of a great visual before we showcase some of our customer visuals that we've done for them over the years. And lastly, we will end with some questions. So for our speaker introductions, my name is Rebecca Davis. I'm sure most of you have probably recognized me by now from doing these webinars for the past four or five years. Um, I'm a project manager at AppGeo, and I primarily focus on the local government side of things, mainly in Connecticut and Rhode Island. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Carson. Carson, you want to introduce yourself? Thanks, uh, Rebecca. Hi, everybody. Uh, happy Thursday. Glad everybody's here. Um, I'm Carson Bellino. I'm a project manager for AppGeo. Um, We've been keeping up with our most recent webinars. You might have seen me on there more frequently. Um, this uh, this month is my third third year at FGO. Um, I manage a handful of the spatial IQ clients from around the New England area here and um, help out with a lot of the the parcel updates and and those those processes that uh, Rebecca has just outlined. Absolutely. All right, so let's talk about the importance um, of a great visual. So I'm pretty sure everybody's familiar with a picture is worth a thousand words, but we found a quote that kind of enhances on that a little bit, kind of intertwining the capabilities and the technology that has, has expanded over the years. So adding an interface is worth a thousand pictures. Um, so whether you're using things like Map Geo or a web map or a dashboard, all of that information is honestly worth a thousand uh, a thousand words just based on that one visual um and it all depends on if you're using a dynamic map which i feel like a lot of you are using map geo in that dynamic way um but i know a lot of you also are probably still using pdf maps or printed maps even and those are the more static maps um that kind of capture the data at a moment of time so just knowing when to use the, those dynamic maps versus the static maps is really important in, in order to be able to get your point across or show your answer to the question that people have been asking you. So let's not waste any more time and let's jump right in. Carson, I'm going to throw it over to you. Great. So I'm going to start us off by talking about some traditional visuals or most likely kind of static and dynamic maps but that you're all likely uh, familiar with. So. So, you know, to start off, we have our, our map grid index. Uh, so this is really a, a, a cover sheet for, you know, a set of PAX maps. In this case, it's for uh, Blackstone, Massachusetts. So this is really a good quick reference guide that gives you an overview of the entire uh, town and then, you know, labels and color and, you know, symbolizes all of the uh, individual sub map groups that are on, you know, are in and around the town. So if you need to find a specific parcel, maybe it's around a, a certain water body, you can use this you know, cover sheet for the tax maps to kind of find quickly where you, you um, what what tax map you need, and then you can kind of quickly go to those. So that's that's uh, that's what that does. 
Uh, and, and now we have our, our tax maps themselves. So in this case, we have one for the, the city of Gloucester, Massachusetts. And you'll see in the top right, we also have uh, the map geo interface for the, the city as well. Um, so, you know, we have on the left here, we have our printed, you know, map or a PDF map. So this is, you know, static map for the year, you know, 2022 that we had done uh, a round of parcel updates with. And then we have, you know, the, the static or the live um, data updated on Gloucester's map geo side. So you can really use these in tandem with each other to get a really good amount of data from this. So on our left, we have our static map here. And as it's been visualized, you can see that all of the um, parcels that are associated with this particular tax map, number 36, are highlighted in white here. And all of the other maps or other parcels and even the roadway polygons and water polygons, those are either grayed out or, or you know, put as a, uh, as a different color. So you can really see quickly here that you're not getting that same information on maybe the map geo side, what parcels are a part of what map at a quick glance. So you can kind of see at the top there on like the, the middle top of the tax map, um, that map 37-1, that's in gray, even though you might expect that to be part of, you know, the other larger set of the parcels in 36. Um, and you can really use the tax maps to do a variety of different quick visual checks on your data. So if you can see on the left-hand side here, we actually have the road center lines highlighted in red. And you can see that actually this road center line that Rebecca is highlighting is actually cutting through a, a parcel property on a, a adjacent map here. So, you know, just having these tax maps also allows you to kind of do quick QC and visual checks of your data. You know, maybe uh, there's a issue with the lot lines, maybe the right of way parcel, uh, parcel is not in the correct spot, or maybe that road center line itself is, is incorrect and needs to be adjusted. So these are, you know, some of the things that you can kind of quickly glance it and figure out using maps uh, with the tax maps. Next, we have a street index map. It's kind of very similar to the map grid index. So we have here the, the city of Ellington, Connecticut. Um, and this has all of their streets laid out with uh, relation to the map grid index. So they have one to about 200 here. And each uh, road is um, in street name is put into the table on the bottom right here. And you can see with, uh, what map numbers are associated with those roads. So what, what um, sections of town, what map sections are these roads going through? So these can be helpful in a variety of different manner, uh, ways. Sometimes um, postal services in town might use these as quick reference guides to kind of see where they can have routes go and, and get the most efficient way. Um, also, since you have these all, you know, gridded out and, you know, there's sections, let's say you have a large street like Main Street or Route 3A that goes through the entirety of your town, um, you can then see all of the subsections that it's touching. So let's say there's a parade going on or there's construction going on, you can more narrowly and more accurately kind of describe where those events are taking place on that long roadway. So let's say Main Street has a, a construction that's going on in map grid, you know, 27 through 29. So you're able to really hone in where exactly things are going on in the streets and, and you know, how these, um, these, sorry, how these uh, events can be mapped out to kind of show them really quickly and get a really good idea of where they are. Next, we have a, a zoning map for the same town of Ellington. So in here we have our, on the top left, we have our uh, PDF or our printed map of the zoning. And you can see here that we're really trying to highlight the rural agricultural and residential zoning layer here in green. Um, and then also we have on the bottom right, we have the same information being displayed on map geo. And so you're kind of can notice right off the bat is that we have a very slightly different um, visual uh, for the actual PDF map compared to the map geo map. And, you know, that's because, you know, consistency on one hand can be a very good thing. So, you know, when you're going from uh, a PDF or a printed map and then going on to the online, having those colors be the same thing can be really helpful for making sure that you're staying consistent with data and that everybody is, knows what they're looking at and is confident in that. But at the same time, we might not always want to have those same visuals be displayed on a map. So on Map Geo, for instance, we had also a lot of other toggleable layers and, and information that we can see on the, the map itself. So things like buildings, easements, utility features, things like that. 
Um, and if you have a big green section for a variety of town, it may be hard to actually see those visuals, especially things like easements, which are already color coded to be green. So, you know, we went with the choice to make this actually, you know, the most dominant color here, our, our rural agriculture residential zoning. We made that white instead so you can see those visuals and those accompanying features and layers uh, a lot easier. So it's something to keep in mind just to make sure that, you know, you're creating data. Uh, and visualizing that data in a way that also conveys what you want and also, you know, complements other, uh, you know, aspects of your map. All right, so, you know, if you're in the New England area, you're probably likely familiar with uh, FEMA's uh, floodplain maps or their firm maps, their uh, flood insurance rate maps. Um, so they're they're basically just outlining where Flood events are likely to happen, you know, where those places are impacted, and then they also affect, you know, the insurance rates of those properties there. So they're very important. Um, one thing to note here, you know, we won't cover this too much, is that the town of uh, West Hartford, they've actually done a really interesting thing where if you are to click on a property, you can actually download the particular uh, firm map, so the, the insurance rate map for that particular parcel or that area. And you can kind of just get that information quickly. So this is a really valuable asset that you know you can share with the public and just allow them to have really quick access to the you know the information that's going to affect their insurance rates and other things like that. All right, so we're going to talk about some custom visuals now, or you know some ones that are kind of more tailored to specific needs of towns uh, that we've worked with. So. Let's uh, let's talk about Acton's trail map. So the the town of Acton, they have a couple of different trail locations. Uh, on the left here, this is just a pretty standard trail map that we've produced for them. Um, it's something that you can laminate, you know, kind of put on the the trail head, you know, right at the entrance. So you can kind of you know give that information to the public um, as they enter the trail uh, locations. Um, you can see on the the bottom left here, you know, we also have a little thing that ties to the website, and that'll give you that same information you know on your phone so when you're walking the trail you can kind of always have that map with you and sometimes we may want to convey additional information you know on on a map so Acton actually also has a couple of Native American stone structures on one of their uh, parcels and so we have created a, a map kind of how um, highlighting the trail or a potential trail as well as uh, the locations of those Native American uh, uh, historic structures. All right, I'm gonna take it back now, Carson. <laughs> so I have another trails example here. This is for the town of Ellington again. Um, and there's a lot going on on this page, but I also wanna highlight several different things. So first off, top left, we have Map Geo. You can see their trails layer is very kind of bland. It just is one color um, with a couple of different labels on it for the trail names, as well as the pop-up link to get to the trail map that you're seeing on the right side, which is kind of in those purple colors. Um, so the trail map that we created for them is for their trails committee. Um, each town, uh, each trail in town on town property has a little bit of a trail guide description up at the top to say kind of how many miles the trail is, the terrain, what everything might be like, and any of the amenities. Um, some of the other things on here you can see are the suggested trail activities. So in this case, we have hiking. And then for the winter months, we have snowshoeing and cross-country skiing. Also within the legend, you can clearly see that there are a couple different trails based on different colors, um, as well as some additional things. So you also have community garden, a sensory garden, a fire pit, an amphitheater, a camping location, a bunch of other things, um, as well as where the parking lot is. And part of this map also includes those yellow squares um, for the emergency trail markers. There's also a picture of it at the very top. And those trail markers you can see in the legend have a single asterisk. Um, and there's a little note at the bottom on the map itself, too, to say that if you're if there's an emergency um, and you can call 911, 911 has been given these maps and they know where all of those locations are. So if you're at Z4 location at the emergency marker on the trail, give 911 a call. They'll be able to come find you and know exactly where you are. Or if you say I'm between somewhere between Z4 and Z3, it's a better guide than saying I'm on the batch property. Um, the other thing we have on here based on the legend um, are the fire pit and the camping sites. 
if you are doing either of those activities, um, there is permission that is required by the town. So you have to go to the town's website um, and fill out an application for those things. And the other unique thing about their maps is the QR code up at the top. So this QR code has been kind of blown up and is in their trail kiosk. So like Carson said, for Acton, you put it at the trailhead and you're able to kind of scan that QR code and that map will come up on your phone. So you can kind of figure out where you're going as you're walking. Moving on to the next one, we have bicycle networks. So for the town of West Hartford, we had helped uh, them create their existing and intended bike routes um, within the town. And you can see here that the map on the left is their static map. And then the map on the right is the dynamic version of it on Map Geo. Um, so the uh, static map you can see has all of the bike route information from the bike routes that are already there as well as the any existing and intended routes. The difference with Map Geo is that you have different toggles for those things, so you can you can focus on one thing rather than the other. So if you wanted to just focus on existing routes in a PDF format, you'd have to have a separate map removing the intended routes. So that's just kind of one main difference between the dynamic and the static is you're able to toggle on some things. Um, also have hovers created. So I blew up the legends on this slide so you guys can see them a little bit more clearly. Um, but you can see that you have shared routes, separated routes, mixed routes, off street um, bike routes and the bike connections as well. So it gives a little bit more information when you hover over one of the layers on Map Geo. And our next map is another West Hartford example for their parks and recreation maps. Um, so on the left here, we have Map Geo. Uh, we had created a data view for them. So instead of focusing on property and parcel data, um, we have it focused on their recreation in town. So all of the red boundary polygons are recreation activities from soccer fields to splash pads to baseball fields to uh, pickleball courts, tennis ball courts, all of those different activities. Um, and also on Map Geo, you are able to, within their property data view now, if you select a parcel, um, it will also show you the nearest park to you. Um, they had that configured in their uh, main view probably a couple years ago. And we've heard really, really great things that people find that extremely helpful to see what parks are near them. Um, and you're also able to see what activities are there as well. So if you're looking for a specific activity, you can also search for that as well in Map Geo. Um, and then on the right, we have the static map, um, which we had exported some PDFs for them. Um, again, showing very, very similar things here. Um, you can see a couple differences that we have their multi-use path on here. Um, so that whether that be for walking, uh, bicycles or anything like that. Um, those are shown on here as well as the labels for the activities um, and something fun that we were able to do was in their legend, um, we were able to kind of add the icons of each sporting activity. Um, so you can kind of quickly see and get that visual of what is available at this park for an activity. Moving on, we have our open space map. Um, this is for the town of Lyme, and as you can see, they have a lot of open space, whether it's protected open space or it's through an open space easement. Um, there are several different uh, use cases for each of those, and obviously you have in the middle here, you have the giant state park, um, which is the protected open space, um, and then you have some of the easements, which are... Um, more on the temporary side that they could change in the future, but technically they've been designated to be open space based on whatever criteria, whether it was a subdivision in that particular parcel or section of a parcel is dedicated to only be open space and can no longer be subdivided. Um, and for Map Geo, similar to Carson's example with Ellington's zoning, we kept the colors as similar as we could between the static map and their Map Geo site. Um, so they can quickly, easily see kind of the same colors schema um, that they're used to on their printed map that they have in town. And the next one is some potential development analyses maps. Um, we have done this for several different towns. As you can see, we've worked with Ellington, Johnson, and Marlboro. Um, all of these potential development sites uh, had a certain criteria that we had to follow. So in these cases, we had a parcel greater than X number of acres. I think in some cases it was four, some it was 10. Um, it all just depends on the town and the, um, the way that the development could be categorized. 
Um, the parcel could not be developed already. It could not be within a flood zone. So again, those flood maps are coming in handy from FEMA and the firm maps. Um, it can't have a slope greater than a certain percentage um, as, well, as well as it cannot have a significant amount of wetlands or water bodies on the parcel and is not protected open space. So having all of those previous data layers created and knowing, those inf and knowing that information, you're able to narrow down the sites that you're able to develop on. So as we can see, Ellington, they chose to highlight the parcels with potential development in that red color. Johnston in the bottom was chose two different color greens. Um, so the darker color green is a parcel that is fully uh, available for development. And then that lighter shade of green is a parcel that's greater than four acres and is partially available for development. So whether that means that parcel could potentially be subdivided and part of that could be used um, for development. So, and then Marlboro is also similar um, where it's got its parcels that have availability for development in clear um, and a hollow color. So you're able to see that ortho imagery below it. Um, so you can see in all of these cases that there are no development, no buildings. It's mainly just kind of some trees on, on the Marlboro property. Next, we have something very similar. We have some location eligibility maps. Um, so the top left, we have uh, Windsor Locks, Connecticut. They were looking to potentially know where they were able to put a dispensary in town. Um, so similarly, they had a criteria. You couldn't be within so many feet within a town buildings, any parks or schools, places of worship, and anything that was in a residential zone. Um, so as you can see here, there's not many places it could go. Um, that top left gray section is the airport, um, so certainly cannot build within the airport, so it really, really limits down where that potential dispensary could be located. And then similarly for Acton, um, we, they had looked to do a firearms business and wanted to see where they could go, again, following certain criteria. Um, their criteria was more based on zoning, but again, still could not be within schools or public parks or town buildings. And again, limited space on where those could go, but Acton has a couple more options than what Winter Locks does. All right, switching gears a little bit and moving to some utility stuff. Um, so we have West Hartford. Again, we've created a, a secondary data view for them. This one is focused on their stormwater data. Um, so as you can see here, instead of focusing on properties, we're focusing on the outfall. So I have that little blue pin dropped on that outfall. It's showing you the picture in the top left corner. Um, with the outfall ID and then some pertinent attributes um, that were coming from the outfalls layer, like the size and material that it is and any of the conditions. And then you also have the DCIA percentage, which is based on the MS4 permit regulations. Um, and then you also can see, unfortunately, you can't see my mouse in here, but I'm hovered over this line right here. So this line is also showing me the, the drain line ID the pipe size and material, and then the shape of the pipe as well. So you get a lot of information on this and it blocks out setting up that separate data view. It blocks out all of that extra noise below. So all of your parcel lines um, with the dimensions and any annotations on there as well. So, and you're also able to focus on drainage attribution. So a drain line ID or an outfall ID, you're able to search on those compared to searching for an address. Um, also on this slide, we have to the right, we have uh, North Haven, Connecticut. This was a map that we had created for them when we were working on their stormwater development project to show all of their drainage mapped in the town. Um, and this map was used for their MS4 annual report as well. Moving on to some septic failures. So in this map, this is for Essex, we're showing their drainage data. Um, and the town of Essex is a little bit unique where they do not have a town sanitary system. Everybody is on a septic. So it's very important to know where any failures, any breaks are in those septic systems as they are right on the water uh, for the Connecticut River. And they also need to know where they're sampling their outfalls. So as we can see here, these Darker green triangles um, are the sampling locations for the MS4 permit. And we have a couple of septic failures that are kind of located around those outfalls. So when they're doing testing um, and sampling of the water, they can possibly identify any contaminants that may have come from those systems that failed. 
Continuing on, um, we have some sewer information. So we have the entire sanitary system mapped out for the town of Cromwell. Um, as you can see, the map kind of in the backside is their very, very large static map. Um, it is printed and it is on their uh, WPCA administrator's office. Uh, I believe it's four, four feet by five feet. Um, so it, it's really large. Unfortunately, it hasn't been updated in a few years. Um, so that's the only problem with the static maps is that you have to keep them updated and you have to print them if they're printed on a wall somewhere or displayed for the public. Um, but they also have a sewer data view set up on their map geo site. And that information is updated twice a year. So it's more current. Um, and it's also a bit more dynamic than just kind of having that visual. It's also linking to their sewer record plans. So the, the plans that were used for us to develop the data is directly on MapGeo, um, which makes things super easy and convenient. And the other thing that they also have is within their property panel um, of their property data view, when you select on a parcel, it will show you what sewer permit lateral cards are associated to that parcel. Um, and whether it's one or whether it's more than one, all of those are linked directly on MapGeo as well. So makes things a little bit easier and, and really brings out that dynamic use um, of having that visual directly on the website. Um, moving on again, we have some street signs. So these are two different visuals that we've done for clients. So the top example on the left is for East Windsor, and we had populated their street signs and did the symbology on MapGeo all in one style. So everything is kind of that basic green sign. Um, and in the attribute for the hover that we have configured on MapGeo, you can see the name of the road that it's on and then also what the sign is and if there's more than one sign at that location. So in this example, you have the screenshot below of what the sign looks like, but you have your railroad crossing sign noting that it is exempt. And then you can also see that there is a second other sign, which is that blue sign in the image that is for any if there's any issues or emergencies on the tracks. Um, a little bit differently, you have Johnson in the bottom right corner which is symbolizing the street sign points based on their type of sign. Um, so things are kind of grouped a little bit more together. So you have stop signs separated out, but then you also have traffic signs, which re might be something like no turn on red um, or left lane must turn left, something like that. Um, and then you also have points of interest and no parking and a couple other things. The only downside to having it symbolized based on this is that if you have more than one sign, um, at that one post, like the railroad crossing, um, you're only able, you're only getting that top sign type of the first one. Um, so if you wanted to see any additional ones, you'd have to hover over it to see those additional signs. All right, Carson, I think I'm going to throw it back to you. Great. Thanks, Rebecca. So this is for the town or the city of uh, Watertown, Massachusetts. So Every uh, week, the Department of Public Works in the city of Watertown uh, sends out a memo to basically the entire town and the residencies, uh, outlining what type of construction work will be done this week, generally in regards to public roads. So things like sidewalk repairs, street repairs, uh, water main, uh, you know, utility work, things like that nature. Um, and so what we've been doing for the city is uh, we have that DPW notice that comes in, and every week we update on this uh, on their MapGeo site a two themes for uh, the construction work. So basically, every week you're able to see a live um, current um, inventory of all the construction that's going on in the city at that time. So that's color coded by you know utilities, sidewalk and roadway work, um, you know things of that nature. So. Um, in this case, we also have visualized uh, completed construction. So this is the historic construction that has been done in the past, you know, from the previous weeks, it's already been wrapped up and it's finished. So you're able to get a lot of information from this ongoing data layer that we're kind of visualizing. So for one, you know, both the um, departments of the city and as well as the residencies can see all the active construction that's going on at a quick notice, you know, if they want to fire up uh, just map geo, they're able to see if there's any heavy downtown construction or if there, there's going to be any construction near them. They don't need to rely on getting that uh, PDF memo from the, the city, um, as well as also some planning purposes. So once you have, you know, built this out for about a year now, which we've been doing, you're going to have a pretty robust and extensive um, mapping of all of the previous construction, the historic 
construction that's been done. So this can be used for a couple of different planning things. You can see where there's a lot of areas that keep getting flagged for maybe sewer work or sidewalk work. Um, you can see areas that really haven't had a lot of construction lately. Maybe it's good to kind of go get an inspection for those sidewalks or the, the stuff around there if they haven't been um, attended to recently. So you're able to get a lot of planning information out of these kind of maps. And this is a, um, a visualization that you really can never have static. So this is one that's really good for dynamic as it's always constantly updating. You can't really get um, a picture visualization of what's going on in a static form like you can with a, a dynamic map that updates weekly like this. Uh, next, we have the historic uh, districts for Chelmsford, um, Massachusetts. Or, um, so right here, you know, as, as a lot of people in New England probably notice, we have a, a large, robust history around here with a lot of historic sites. Those historic sites, they also have a lot of building restrictions and things like that, conservation, easements, you know, things of that nature that may pose planning and, and you know, building challenges. So having a list and a visualized list of all these things can be really helpful and they can be utilized in overlay with other things. You can create buffers from them. You're able to kind of get a really good inventory here. So in this case, we're blowing up the center of downtown here, which has a lot of that information. The bottom right have kind of highlighted the garrison building, the old garrison house, which is um, a building from, I believe, 1691. So they have some really, really old historic information here that they want to preserve, you know, highlight, you know, for <clears throat> tourist reasons, building reasons, a bunch of different things. So, and also just, you know, cultural preservation. So having this information is really good for planning, you know, tourism and all, all that type of stuff. Next, we have Gloucester, Massachusetts burn regulation map. So this is actually a pretty standard map. It's basically, you know, very intuitive. You don't even really need a legend to see what's going on here. All the green areas, you know, those are burn, uh, burn permit uh, permitted areas and all the areas in red are uh, non, uh, non burnable areas. You can't be doing any open burning there. Um, and then you have, obviously, we can link in the legend to things like the actual um, information that's being provided by the city itself. So, in, you know, the bottom right here, we just have kind of an open link to their open burn permits and regulations. In this map, you can see that most of the uh, the downtown city area of Gloucester is, is pretty much off limits. And then as you go out, you're more free to burn at your leisure. Uh, drive and walk time. So this one in particular, really interesting stuff. You can do a lot of different things, but uh, creating maps of this nature. Uh, in this particular case for West Hartford, you know, during the pandemic, we wanted to kind of reduce the amount of people that are showing up to the ballot box and kind of cramming all into the school or wherever, you know, the town hall and, and kind of uh, spreading uh, any potential disease. So what we did was uh, take all the point locations of the ballot boxes and polling locations and did a drive time and walk time analysis to kind of see how far and you know what um, areas of the city or the town are being um, covered uh, in, in these certain time intervals. So you can see in, in the orange and red, you have walking times from distance. So the orange is in 10 minutes. The red is 20 minutes away, and then you have in green and blue your drive time. So, you, you know, using this information, you can kind of um, identify locations that may need a ballot box place so people have walkable access to one. Uh, and that can really help reduce the amount of uh, load and strain a particular uh, polling location they receive. And this isn't just for polling locations. This is really a, a really usable um analysis tool that you can use for a, a large amount of different things, you know, whether that be school walk times, you know, finding out, you know, how walkable uh, to you, like your local elementary schools are, um, and, you know, same thing for food deserts, you can do that with supermarkets and convenience stores to kind of highlight if there's an area that doesn't have quick and easy access to uh, grocery shopping and things of that nature. Um, you know, anything you can really think of with points and polygons, you can really use uh, drive and walk time analysis to get a really good visualization of what's going on um, and how how your um, area, your town, your city is is covered and uh, and getting the the access to the um, facilities that they need. Awesome. 
Yes. So the next one that we have is renewable energy. So we had created this map for Johnston, Rhode Island, um, showing their solar areas and any of the wind turbines that they have in the town. Um, you can kind of see right off the bat, looking at the map on the left, that there's kind of this uh, area just to the south um, of the main roads there that you have those clusters of solar areas, as well as that very, very southern uh, section of the area for wind turbines. Um, and if you look close enough in the enlarged photo, you can see the shadow of the wind turbine on the ortho imagery as well, which I think is pretty cool. <laughs> Um, and then this is probably one of my favorite maps. Um, this map is four and a half feet by six and a half feet. So it is massive. Um, and every time that the town has a revaluation for their assessing values, uh, this gets hung up in their town meeting room. Um, and folks or residents are able to see exactly where their property is and kind of what their value has changed based on the last reval. Um, so you can see here that the southern section of town has had a drastic increase um, in prices, whereas the northeastern side of the town um, hasn't had too much change. So there's a couple of red patches here and there. So if, for example, somebody had a question um, of this parcel down here, it's a very dark red and kind of a cluster of some yellows where there wasn't too much change. So what might be causing that would be a question that they would ask and um, the assessor would be able to answer those questions. Or in another example, you look down here um, in this lower section where it's all very much red um, and you can say like, why did my property value go up? But then looking at this map, you can see the entire neighborhood that you live in has gone up. So it's not just you. Um, this is one of the town's favorite maps as well. I believe he has this still hanging up on his wall um, in his office, so. Um, our next one is a buffer analysis. So two different visuals here. Um, we have the one on the bottom, uh, which is a very simple buffer just from the centroid of a parcel um, to go 100, 100 feet, 250 feet, and 500 feet away from that centroid. Um, and then the top right example, we have Manchester um, in Massachusetts, where they were looking to get a list of the parcels within half a mile of the train station. Um, so Highlighting those parcels in green are kind of that first giveaway. You also have that radius um, of that half mile buffer from that point. And then you also have the list within the PDF itself um, of all of those parcels. Since it is a map of the entire town, you're not able to kind of label all of those individual parcels. So having a list right on the map is a little bit, I would say a little bit more dynamic, but dynamic is probably not the right word. It's probably a little bit more intricate um, where you're not just seeing it, but you also able are to um, get a list of those parcels that are within that half mile. Um, and the unique situation about the Ellington map is that that map was used in a murder trial, um, which was an NBC Dateline uh, episode, in case anybody's curious. <laughs> Um, all right, we are going to take a little bit of a break. Um, we have one audience poll for you guys to fill out. We're curious to know what types of maps you're using on a daily basis. Are you using static maps, digital PDF maps, or are you using interactive web maps? Um, and in the poll, you should be able to identify if you're using one or if you are using all three. So I'm going to launch this poll right now. You should have a pop up on your screen. We'll give people a couple seconds here to put some stuff in. All right, so far we're looking that a lot of folks are using static maps um, and trailing right behind that are the digital and interactive maps. It's good to know that people are still printing maps. I think it really depends on the use case. Um, for why you're printing a map. So like the trails maps, you wanna have those maps printed off and at the kiosk, um, whereas maybe some of your other maps that you use for um, town meetings or whatever are fine just to be digital maps. So I'm gonna end this poll and I will share the results so everybody's able to see what the results came in as. Um, thank you for taking that poll. All right, I'm gonna close that. So that should end for all of you and we will continue on person. You're muted. Sorry about that. We're going to talk about some uh, interactive visuals, namely some some dashboards here to kind of really hone in what we're talking about here. So for this is the uh, 
town of West Hartford's crash dashboard. So this is really highlighting the accidents history of the town itself and kind of giving us information on what exactly is going on in the town. And we'll do a live demo here. Show it off in a live sense so you can really get an idea of um, what kind of information you're getting. So we have 11,000 crashes, wow, um, <laughs> quite a bit. So. Uh, in here, you can see you can select on the top left, um, you know, a, a select year, or you can do all of them. So you know, 2015 through 2021. We have obviously the main um, panel that Rebecca's panning through, and that gives you the visual information. So you can see the locations. You can also see that we all have um, street signs symbolized here. So those uh, octagons, those are our stop signs. We have our do not enter signs. And then we have some crash type uh, statistical information here in our bar. So this bar chart is basically showing reports of the number and the types of crashes that we're seeing. So an angle crash, that's like your typical T-bone. I'm very familiar with that. Um, there's uh, front and rear ends, you know, others, uh, side swipes, things of that nature. So you're able to kind of get all that information and really get some good information and what Rebecca has just pulled up as well is um, our particular point, and that gives you all of the crash information, you know, with a lot more detail, the number of vehicles, the date of the crash, um, the severity, you know, what happened, a bunch of just really important information. Um, and so you also kind of get that on the right side too, so you can see, you know, once she's clicked on that, you have your vehicles involved, and that gives you some other information about what's happened in that area. And the other thing, too, is we do have this, uh, how do I clear the results? There we go. You're able to see, too, the driver action. So you can also see if, it, if the driver was falling too closely, which caused the accident, um, or just improper backing. Um, there's a couple of different examples, too. If I clear the results, we can see all of them for this particular area that I'm zoomed into. So the number one is following too closely, which is 3.1 thousand, which is a lot. Um, and you also have some of the other ones, let's see, ran a red light, ran a stop sign, improper turning, improper backing, and failing to keep a proper lane. So crossing over that yellow line. So yeah, this gives you some really, really powerful planning and, you know, just data visualization here. So you're putting, you know, statistics, you know, really important details about crashes and you're putting a visual and spatial component to it. So you can really see that, you know, in certain areas in West Hartford here, you're getting a lot more accidents in, in you know, the four-way intersection that you can see on the map as compared to, you know, the intersection to the, the top uh, that Rebecca's highlighting where it's probably much more uh, well regulated with their, their stop signs and their speed limits. So you're able to kind of get a lot of planning information out of this and, and determining if things need to be updated or if there needs to be a greater safety regulation imposed in certain areas. Yes, and the other thing that I will add to that too is we've recently had a conversation with the town too about working on Vision Zero, um, which is a zero crash town and improving your roadways um, so there's no accidents going on. Sorry, yeah, my dog is chewing a, something. It's a wonderful way to kind of get towards that that zero crash rate. Um, so if you're really shooting for goals like that, you know, dashboards can be a really um, powerful tool that can help, you know, plan long-term projects like that. All right. So then back to our slides, we're going to go to our next one, which is Blue Hills Reservation. And I'm just going to open up the experience builder. Um, there's a lot going on here. So Carson, I will move as you talk. <laughs> cool. So kind of a, a quick overview here of what's going on. The Blue Hills Reservation, it's a... Um, conservation area around uh, downtown Boston, um, you know, near downtown Boston that kind of protects the, um, the, the, the ecological area around here and kind of gives uh, uh, nice walking in, in trails and then also um, provides some, some housing and protection for um, some, some niche species. Like actually we have timber rattlesnakes that are only located in the Blue Hills Reservation, um, which is very cool. Um, so in this case right here, um, the conservation department wanted to um, identify uh, adjacent properties, so properties that are, uh, you know, abutting properties that are directly um, 
linking or adjacent to uh, the current conservation area. And so we have this final index score on the right here. Um, and that is a score of how useful the property would be for acquisition by the conservation department to help facilitate and create a strong buffer to preserve the conservation area and make sure that those species and those, you know, uh, trails and, and the things that everybody really loves about Blue Hills is, is preserved for as long as possible. So things with a higher index score are things that are of more benefit to be potentially purchased for the purposes of creating a buffer around the reservation. So you're able to kind of uh, filter out a lot of these things. You know, do you want to see just the high ones? Do you want to see just the low score ones? Um, and once you get that, you can get a lot of um, really great information that comes out of it. Let's see if we can pull some of that up. I was trying to click on one of the higher ones and then it decided to not load again. <laughs> Sorry about that. Let's see if it'll see if it'll work now. There we go. Great. So yeah, once once you have that information, you can kind of click on these things, really get a good idea. Here's the address, 140 Hills Drive, Quincy. You get property information in this case. You can see there's a local ID. And then you get your index score. So that's a you know a lightly colored one, about 76, I believe. So it's mid-range, a good potential candidate for you know acquiring for, for buffer reasons. Um, so you can get a lot of information about this. You need to get land use descriptions. So this is currently flagged as an open space uh, property, uh, you know, the area, uh, as well as the zoning and land use scores, which just kind of gives you some background information on why exactly this is being um, scored in the way it is and why it might be of use to the, the conservation department in, in potentially acquiring at that location. Yeah, and just to save on time, there are a bunch of different toggles here um, that you can choose to see just different uh, ranks, ranked scores um, for that final index. But we'll jump back into the slides. And our last one is the story map for Johnston. Um, we had worked on a project for their zoning um, to show parcels with this land discrepancies um, based on the residential zone that they were in. Um, so here we kind of have a brief description of kind of what the story map is showing. Um, and then you jump into some maps. This is kind of just the map of the entire town to show all of the lots that are non-conforming based on that hatch area. So anything that kind of looks a little bit gray um then you keep scrolling down to see kind of some focused areas so here we're going to start off in the r10 zone r7 zone excuse me um so basically anything that is less than 7,000 square feet in the r7 zone um are considered non-conforming um so this kind of gives a very very quick picture to the uh the, to the town to say like why are these non-conforming does something need to be changed in terms of their zoning do parcels need to be merged? Whatever the case may be, this kind of gives the town just that visual. Um, and if you continue scrolling down, it'll jump to each of the sections just to kind of a quick bookmark that was created in the web maps um, to see those different zone types. Continue on to the R15, you can see things are getting a lot bigger and there's a lot more zoning discrepancies going on with that those non-conforming lots. A couple more examples of it for the R20 and then the R40 zones. And then continuing to scroll down, you also see some use code discrepancies as well. So if something is coded as, let's see if I can get an example here. This one might be a good one. So this is currently industrial land and it is currently zoned for uh, industrial, but the use that is identified in the assessor system is a commercial. Um, not that those two are extremely different, but it's enough to throw that flag out there for the for the GIS data. And as you can see, I'm able to zoom in. I'm zooming out in here. I can pan around to find a parcel that I want. Very, very, very interactive. Um, and then continuing down the rest of the story map, you're able to see kind of the conclusion and any of the lessons learned that were cre that were created during this project. Yes, just one one final point on story maps is if you haven't used them before, they're really, really powerful tools for kind of uh, conveying a message in a way that, you know, maps, obviously, they're used as well to convey messages and, and kind of try to get across the point that you want to get. But a story map really allows you to kind of put some text, put a narrative behind it and give you a really good way to kind of 
make your case, so to speak, if you have maybe something that you're going to bring up to a planning board or, or department uh, meeting and you really want to sell this or even just public awareness, you know, why we might be doing something, why a project might be occurring. These are really, really powerful tools that allow you to kind of visualize as well as tell that story uh, with writing and in some other kind of ways in a neat visual and interactive way that we just kind of showcase being able to kind of quickly uh, move around the interactive map as you're scrolling down it. So that's something that's really powerful and something that to kind of think about if you're if you're potentially trying to, to tell a story and, and you know, really uh, sell something to uh, whoever, uh, you know, the public, other departments, your own department, these are really powerful tools for that. Absolutely. And same with the experience builder for Blue Hills, you're able to get so much information on here. And again, this can be shared to the public or kept internally um, for the department or the organization to see what is going on. All right, couple more slides here. So we have one final audience poll, which is more of a question. So our question to you is what other unique map visuals have you created? If it's been made for you, something that you created, or if somebody had created a map and just shared it with you, we want to hear those examples. So you can throw those into the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, and we can kind of read off some of those answers that come in whenever they come in. Let's see, I'll just put my chat over here. Throw those in. We'll keep moving on. If anything comes in, we will definitely read the answers um, to everybody at the end. So in summary, I'm kind of going back to our uh, slide uh, or our, our quote that we had um, and for the importance that it, picture really is worth a thousand words and that interface is worth a thousand pictures. Um, the, the main point of it all being that if you have an idea or better yet, if you have a problem that you need to solve, solve it with a creative visual. Um, it'll do all of the talking for you for the most part, certainly depending on what you're showing, you might need to have some context there, but really you want that visual to, to tell your story, to share what you need to share um, and to get your point across. And, and Abjue is here to help with that. So we have a team of GIS analysts and our project managers, we all know what to do and we are here to help you even if you wanna brainstorm um, any of the issues or problems that you're having that you wanna solve, we will figure out the best way to do it, whether it's a PDF map, a theme on Map Geo, a, a dashboard, um, or a story map. 